<laughs> well, we welcome anybody who may be watching with us at home and welcome you guys here. If you, if you just picked up with us at home, you missed some good tire changing stories just now. And uh, come on if you can, and we'll, we'll fill you in on all that. Uh, we're glad to be able to come back and get into a, a regular Sunday evening Bible study. We hadn't had a regular one since, since May 16th. Can you believe that? That's uh, almost a full month ago. So we're glad to have things. Had, had a great time with the VBS kickoff Sunday night. Had a great time with, uh, with um, the state of the church. We had a great time with VBS itself. And uh, now I'm having a great time to get back into a good routine of studying through Mark uh, on Sunday evening. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we get started. Father in heaven, we're thankful, Lord, for your grace and your love to us. We thank you for a great morning here. We thank you for the Cockrell family that you brought to us uh, to, to serve on our staff and, and to serve with us together here in our church. God, we thank you for the ministry that they're doing even now uh, with our students and with our youth committee. Lord God, we pray blessings upon their family, and, and we thank you for the blessing that they already are and will continue to grow to be for us here at Harrisville Baptist Church. Lord God, I thank you for VBS and for a great week of it. And uh, Father, for the many things that you're doing. Well, we pray again that you continue to be with Jamie Smith as she gets ready to uh, to go off and, and, and be in basic training there with her, for the Army, or for, excuse me, for the Air uh, Guard. Lord, we pray that you keep her safe and strengthen her and use her in a mighty way for your kingdom there uh, wherever she goes. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, and we ask that you would uh, speak to us in these next few verses of, of uh, Mark chapter 10, that you teach us what you'd have us to learn, and God, draw us closer to you because of it. <laughs> Father, we love you. We ask you to, uh, to work now as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, when we last left off a month ago, Jesus had taught about divorce. He taught about little children and letting them come to him. And he talked about the, the, the great difficulty, nay, impossibility of people who put too much love in their things and in themselves. Uh, the difficulty of them being able to come and truly put their faith in Christ. Uh, and so we pick up here, uh, we'll be in Mark 10, beginning with verse 32, and we'll finish the chapter out. Um, and man, there's going to be a, a request of all requests that gets asked. And uh, Mark is nice to these guys, and just and you'll know a little bit more about what I'm talking about in just a second. But uh, he's nice to the guy, these guys. Another gospel writer would tell that it was their mama that asked him, uh, that asked Jesus this big, bold, audacious, and maybe a little wrong uh, question. But we'll get to that in just a second. Let's take a look at Mark 10, beginning with verse 32. And there we read. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him, spit on him, and flog him, and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. And then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. And they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink. And be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all for even the son of man did not come to be saved to be served excuse me but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many and then they came to jericho as jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city a blind man bartimaeus which means son of timaeus was sitting by the roadside begging and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And so they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. And throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. 
What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. So a few different things are happening here. And the first one, the, the first small part of the passage or, or the half of the chapter that we're looking at, um, Jesus does something that is, is common. He's done it twice already in, my, in Mark's account. He, uh, he's done this in, in the disciples' hearing for their purpose of hearing and for their benefit. And yet he does it again and he gets zero response. Of course, what we're talking about is he's going to predict his death. They're going up to Jerusalem. Of course, Jerusalem sits on a mountainside or on a mountaintop there, a plateau there in that area. And so wherever you came, whether you were coming from north, south, east, west, whatever, you still have to go up physically, geographically to Jerusalem. So Jesus is leading them. Um, and, uh, and it says that in, in verse 32 there that the, the, the ones that are with them are, are amazed and, and even some are afraid uh, of what's going on. Now we don't, uh, there's, a, there's a few different possibilities here. It may be because of what they're seeing. It may be because of what Jesus is saying. But at any rate, there is some fear involved with this. And then that is compounded by this heavy thing that Jesus says to them. Now imagine your tour guide is taking you, you know, on a tour in, in I don't know, pick a place. Uh, the Grand Canyon, and, uh, and, and you're walking up this path, and you're, you know, you're winding up the, the, the side of the, of the canyon there, and, and he says, okay, now at the top of this, um, I know I've been kind of helping you out and getting you through all this. At the top of this, I'm going to be taken away, and you won't have me anymore. Now, unless you live in that particular area of the Grand Canyon and know it very well, you might be a little alarmed at that, right? That might be like, whoa, wait, wait, go back to that again. Say, you know, what, what are you talking about? How you're going to go away? You you know, and, and what if he said, hey, at the top of this ridge, there's going to be some people waiting for me and uh, they're going to kill me. Um, that would definitely get the tour group's attention, right? I mean, people would say, hang on, hang on, wait, who, what, what are we doing here? That would get their attention. Well, here are these disciples, including the 12, following Jesus up to Jerusalem. And he says very plainly in verse 33, we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles. That'd be bad enough, but those Gentiles, verse 34, will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. Now, maybe it simply marks a counting of it, but it seems like in the way we read it in the gospel of Mark, Nobody said anything. <laughs> Jesus now, for at least the third time on Mark's record, has said that he is going to be, he's going to be killed. He's not speaking figuratively. He's, he's speaking very literally. He's going to be killed. He said he's going to rise again, which is kind of a big deal too. And yet, no discussion about that. I think that in the Holy Spirit's inspiration of Mark in writing this, as well as in Mark's understanding of what he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is he gets to the next thing because it ties into this. Here, Jesus has predicted the biggest event in all of human history. He says, predicted it again. And these guys, these men that are with him, have no interest in that, apparently. Mark is telling us where these guys' heads are at. And that's going to come back into play when we read about, or when we go talk about Bartimaeus at the end of the chapter here in just a second. We'll get there. The very next thing that we read in verse 35 has nothing to do with Jesus dying, nothing to do with him being arrested, rising again, any of those things that are the biggest action in history, in all of mankind's history. And verse 35 says, Then, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Now, these are disciples that have been with him since the beginning. They're, they're close to him. They're, they're part of the inner core. And they come to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Well, this seems kind of strange, doesn't it? I mean, that, that seems a bit selfish just to even say that. Um, you know, when your children or your grandchildren come to you and say, You know, I'd like for you to do just whatever I want. What response do they get from you? Now, when they're cute and little, they might be like, hey, whatever you want, baby, we'll do that right now. When they get old and stinky as teenagers and, and you know, young adults, then it's like, well, what boy? What, you, you know, what girl are you talking about? You know, uh, what, I, what you want me to do what you want? Well, uh, that, this goes the other way around, you know. Pay some rent, get a job, do something, you know. Uh, but here these disciples come up to Jesus 
And they say, we want you to do something for us. We want you to do not just something for us. We want you to do whatever we ask. It's almost like, kind of like the Pharisees. It's almost like they're trying to kind of pin Jesus down on this. They're doing like our kids do with us, right? Or like our, our, you know, like children do. Will you do me a favor? (laughs) You know, and they don't tell us what it is. They get us to agree to do it first. And then they tell us what it is. And then we're stuck, right? Well, he he says to him in verse 36, he says, what do you want me to do for you? So he hasn't actually said he's going to do it, but he's, he's, he's listening to them. He's, he's maybe even humoring them a little bit, but he's going to teach them here too and teach us as well. Verse 37, they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. All right. Now you've probably heard this before. Many of you have probably even taught this in, in different Bible studies as well. Uh, but the right and the left of the person of honor at whatever gathering were the two most important places in the room, two most important seats at the table, two most important places of status, not just to be close to that person, but you were, you were put on display with that person. So if, if you were to go into the king's throne room and be sat at his right hand uh, or at his left hand, those were very important places that you didn't just walk in and go oh that chair is open i'll go sit at the right hand of the king that would have been punishable in most courts by death that that was because it was such a special place well here is jesus the king of kings lord of lords and he has been teaching his disciples that he is going to come into his glory they believe him to be the messiah they believe him to be the one who has been promised for generation upon generation they believe that he is this one and these two guys They're not terrible guys. They're just guys. They're just regular people like me and you. They, in their mind, think that now is the best time. They're like, oh, yeah, enough about that dying and rising again thing. Here, Jesus, we want to be the two most important people in all of creation under you. That's pretty much what they're asking. To be able to sit at his right and his left. Now, they're already in the inner circle, They're already in the disciples. They're already amongst his people that get to live with him in a way that very few people got to do. So they're already amongst a very small part of of the human, you know, experience. Uh, They're a very small part of the population of what they've already got to experience. But they want more, and they want more for themselves. Now, another gospel would record this, like I said earlier, that their mom came and asked, can my sons sit at your right and at your left. Man, let me tell you something. My mom might would ask that for me <laughs> for different things, but I'm going to tell you what, I wouldn't love it because <laughs> I know my friends and those guys around me would be about to, to razz me for the rest of my natural life and then some uh, because, oh, yeah, your mom had to come and ask, you know. Um, so wh- whether it was mom asked or, or James and John asked, I mean, that's, that's really just storytelling at that point. It doesn't diminish the, the fact that it happened. This request is made well jesus reasons with him he says you don't know what you're asking can you drink the cup i drink from or be baptized with the baptism i am baptized with the answer to that is is no (laughs) because no one can do what jesus is about to do we know that the cup that he drinks from uh is referring to the punishment that he's going to face on the cross i mean what does he pray to, to our Heavenly Father, to his Heavenly Father in the garden? If it be your will, take this cup from me. But not, nevertheless, your will, not my will be done. That's the cup that he's drinking. The cup of, of the wrath being poured out from God the Father on all the sin of all of mankind for all of eternity. On him and him feeling every ounce of it. Him feeling every bit of it. Him feeling every every bit of punishment that was meant for everyone including me and you he feels that that's the cup that he would drink from and the baptism that he would have would be the 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 immersion into and the and the 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 recognition as the one savior and he's looking at them and he's saying look can you do that and the answer is no they can't do that he's again he's he's working with them they say in verse 39 and crazy fashion we can they say oh absolutely jesus we are with you we're we're going to do just like you do and yet they're still making these requests so what we see here is is we see that james and john while being normal disciples normal people they're still not getting it fully they're still not understanding what this jesus is really teaching 
They're still in the learning curve. They're still figuring it out. God is still showing them and teaching them. That's exactly what Jesus does here. Now Jesus gets a little bit more serious with them. He says, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. Well, wait, Rich, I thought you said they couldn't do that. Well, now, they don't die. You know, James and John don't die for the sins of the world. And they are not anointed as the Messiah. Neither one of them. But what Jesus is saying is, is you will die for the glory of our Heavenly Father, as Jesus does. You won't accomplish the same thing, but you'll go through it. Now, they won't feel the sin and punishment and wrath of God for all the sin of the world, but they'll suffer in death. And they will. And they do. And they will be baptized. They will be known as apostles. They will be known in God's kingdom and, and, and as important people. They will be, they will be you know, identified in that way. He says, that will happen. He says, but, verse 40, to sit at my right hand or my left hand is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Now, of course, the natural question there would be like, well, okay, well, who's that? You know, well, that we don't get to hear that part of the conversation if, if indeed that part took place. What Jesus says here is, is some things are going to happen that are, are similar to what you're asking for, but you don't fully understand how it all fits together. You don't understand what's going on. And isn't that true of our lives too? I mean, isn't that true for us? When we put our faith in Christ, we're, you know, like we talked about this morning, like Paul said, to live as Christ and to die as gain. And we, we, we cling to that. Hopefully that's, that's part of our thinking each day is, God, if you give me this day, I'm going to serve you. And if, if you take me from this earth today, if, you, if my days are done here, then it's only going to get better from here because I know where I'm going and I know I'll be present with you. It, hopefully that's the way, you know, that, that, we, that we think. But we don't know how that's going to play out. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what great blessings are going to come and what things that are blessings that are going to feel like curses are going to come. We don't know what our bodies are going to go through. We don't know what our minds are going to go through. We don't know what our hearts are going to go through. We may have lived for a long time with, with growing faith in Christ, having no idea of the, of the crisis of belief that's coming to us. It could be coming, and it does come for many of us. We have no idea of the disease or the diagnosis that we may be given. We have no idea of accidents that will happen. And the things, as we live these things out, God is right there with us to teach us how it fits into his story, how, how we fit into what he's doing. If we knew it all up front, if we knew exactly how it would work, we'd mess it up. Because inevitably, in our sinful nature, even saved as we may be, we would say, okay, well, I don't want to do this part, and we'd skip that. And whatever we were supposed to learn in whatever this part was going to be, we'd miss. And whatever impact us going through something was supposed to have on someone else and influencing them towards Christ... That's lost. He's telling them, I get that you want to be first. He doesn't blow them away. He is serious with them. He says, God our Father knows. He's the one who gets to say. Jesus submitted himself and submits himself and always will submit himself to the will of the Father. That's why he's waiting even now, right at the right hand of the Father, for his Father to look at him and say, go, and that's, that's when he'll return. Jesus isn't going to decide on his own when to return. He's submitting to the will of his, of his Father, as we do as well. So he's saying, look, these things are going to happen, but what you're asking, you don't get it enough to be able to make this request. And so he has some mercy on them there. The other ten don't have as much mercy on James and John. Verse 41, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. And now that one verse probably is a summary of what's going on. Uh, can you imagine what guys like Peter would have to say to James and John who have gone up and asked Jesus, hey, can we be way more important than these other ten guys? Because, <laughs> you know, Peter's like, man, I should have asked that first. Now, you know, I, no one, that's my seat. What are you talking about? They're not any better than these two guys, but you better believe in that moment they were like, dummies, why would you ask that? And, and, and the inside going, you know, and that's where I'm going to be sitting, you know. They're indignant with them, and, and, and you know that men being men in, the, in any generation, in any culture, 
<laughs> James and John had a hard time here. Well, Jesus being the mediator and, and the referee that he often was with the disciples, he, uh, he, it says in verse 42, Jesus called them together. That may have felt like he grabbed them by the ears and said, come here, <laughs> let me just fix this real quick. You know, But he, he called them together and he said, he explains and he teaches all of them, which lets us know that this was not something that just James and John were thinking about, talking about, maybe even making these requests of being the greatest these guys wanted to be the greatest too. Who are these guys? These guys are lowly fishermen and uneducated men who Jesus has brought, and now all of a sudden they're in the spotlight. Now all of a sudden they're the ones serving these crowds. They're the ones going out and casting out demons and healing people, and they're right there with Jesus when he's doing the same thing. This temptation to make it about them is right there, and this is what he addresses here. He says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. What he means by Gentiles here is people who are not God's people, right? He's saying, you know how the world does this. That's the, this is, that's the emphasis there. He says, those who are regarded as rulers lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. In other words, authority is a thing to be flaunted. Authority is a thing to be shown off, to be reveled in. That's what it is for the world. He says, not so with you in verse 43. In other words, that's not the way it works in his kingdom. He says, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. He's already told them here earlier in this chapter that many who are first will be last and the last will be first. He's, he's already introduced this concept and he's furthering this explanation of it here. And he's saying, look, if you want to be great, serve. If you want to be exalted, humble yourself. That's a kingdom principle that's in play in Jesus' teaching several times throughout the Gospels. And it's something that is played out in the teaching of God's kingdom and as the church, that we should not try to say, well, you know, well, I'm the pastor of this church. We're going to do it because I said so. And that, yeah. No, that's not the case. Pastors, we should serve. Well, I'm a deacon. I, should not, I, I decided this with this group of men, and we're going to do it. No, deacons should serve. I, well, I'm the Sunday school teacher. I'm the, I'm the kitchen lady. Well, you know, whatever. Pick a, pick, a, a, pick a position of authority and responsibility. It's about serving at every turn, every time. Now, sometimes you have to make a decision. You have to lovingly hold, you know, hold people accountable to it. But it's not about lording that authority over it. It's not about being boss. It's about serving. That's what Jesus says. He says, anyone who wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be slave of all. What he's doing is, is he's taking out that human and sinful desire to be number one. You see, because if we want to be number one, then in our lives, Christ can't be number one. But if Christ is number one, then that means we don't desire to be number one anymore. And as we live with Christ as the head of our life, the head of our desires, the head of our future and our ambition and all the other things that go with it, well, then now it's not about how far I can go. It's how far Christ will take me and how much I can glorify him as he carries me through. He says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He says, even I, Jesus, who had every right to say, hey, you'll do what I say because I said so. You'll do what I say because I was there when you were created. <laughs> you know, uh, I was there when you were thought up and before then. He doesn't do that. He serves. He gives his life. He, he serves even to the point of dying. Lord willing, next Sunday morning, we'll do the first half of Philippians chapter 2, which explains about how our attitude should be, uh, if we're living a life worthy of the gospel, of the, the same attitude as Christ had, that he would humble himself even to death and death on a cross. That's what we'll read in Philippians 2. Well, that's what he's saying here. He's saying even the Son of Man, even the one who will be exalted is only exalted after he serves, after he lowers himself. Remember, he just predicted his death again. He's already talking about that. And here these guys are talking about wanting to be the big shots, wanting to be the important people, the most important people in all creation under Jesus. And he's saying, no, it's not about that. Now, what did they come and ask him? James and John started this part of the conversation by coming and asking him, hey, we want you to do something for us. Well, let's take a look at somebody else who's going to, make a request of Jesus, and who's going to meet with a different response. 
we read about Bartimaeus. It says they came, uh, then they came to Jericho in their journey. They came through Jericho. And there, as, as they would come to each city, each major town, each minor town even, as they would approach the city gates somewhere right outside the city gates, more than likely, occasionally inside the city gates, but most of the time outside the city gates, there would be the people who were, uh, who were invalids, there were people who were crippled, there were people who were disabled, there were people who were poor, there were people who were uh, ill and, and diseased in many different ways that kept them from being able to be thought of as normal people. And so they couldn't hold normal jobs and make a normal living. So what were they having to resort to? They'd have to come outside these city gates, and as people would come in and out, they'd have to beg. This was just a part of life. Um, I think uh, I think we think we see this, but it's a little different um, for us. I think for the most part, we think, and we, we like we were talking about with, with some folks just a minute ago before we started our Bible study, you know, there's opportunities that can be had to work, even if you have disabilities, especially in our country. Many things have been done. Many acts have been passed and laws have been adopted that help people who are, are you know, for whatever reason thought to be less than to be able to make a living and, and, and to do things. Not a perfect world, we know that, but, but, but there's some advantages. These folks were literally, you know, outcasts from their families, outcasts from their society and, and to the point where they may not have even been allowed in the city gates. And things, not just necessarily for making bad decisions in their life, it's not stuff that was their fault. This man is blind. You'd have others that couldn't talk, that couldn't hear, couldn't walk. They'd be out there begging. That's, that's what's going on. They came to, Je to Jericho, and Jesus uh, and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, and that just means, the word bar means son of, um, and so the son of Timaeus. Now, that, does, uh, that may mean that, may mean that he was so insignificant to the people that they didn't even give him another name. It may mean that that's just the way that, that Mark understood and referred to him. Uh, he says, Bartimaeus was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. All right, this is significant because of two things. One, he's heard of Jesus. And so now he couldn't go and find Jesus like so many other people had and, and follow him. He had to wait until Jesus came to him because of his disability and his station in life at that point. So number one, he's heard of Jesus and he's been waiting on him. Number two, he believes that Jesus is who Jesus is. And that's where the son of David, he's, he's calling him, this is, this is a messianic term. He's calling him Savior. He's calling him Lord and calling him son of David. Um, not just speaking genealogically, but, but he's saying promised one, Messiah, the, the one that, that we've been waiting for. Um, his faith is in believing that this is who Jesus is. He says, Son of David, have mercy on me. And of course, the people around him are like, oh, stop, stop, stop. You're embarrassing us. Don't do this. But he doesn't let, him hold him back, uh, let that hold him back. It says, all the more, he shouted, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said two words, call him. So they're, they're leaving the city. Maybe they've passed by him. And here he is. He's, he's hollering. And Jesus stops. Everything and everybody stops. And he says, bring that man here. So they called to the blind man. And they say, cheer up. Because most of the time when Jesus addressed somebody in this situation, it was about to be better for them. Because of his love, because of his power, because of his authority. Depending on what they said, more than likely they were about to be healed. So the, the people have caught on to this, right? They say, cheer up, get on your feet. He's calling you. There were a lot of other people begging, but he called Bartimaeus. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Now, again, he's blind, but uh, other than that, there, there doesn't appear to be anything else physically wrong with him. But being blind is enough, right? I mean, to, to severely limit, especially in this day and time, and in this culture, what you're able to do in the world. And Jesus in verse 51 says, what do you want for me, or what do you want me to do for you? Now, if you just go back, in my Bible, just the way it's printed, just the top of the previous column of Scripture, you have him ask that same question to James and John. What do you want me to do for you? That's verse 36 and verse 51, 15 verses later. What do you want me to do for you? Two totally different requests though, right? James and John were about them and wanting to be better and be best. They were able to do all, they weren't outcasts like this. They were in the inner circle and they wanted to be greater. 
This man simply wants to be whole. He wants to be able to be accepted in the community. He wants to be able to be productive. He wants to be able to have dignity. He wants to be able to do these things. Not to, he doesn't ask, make me the greatest person of all creation. It says, the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. The same question from Jesus, but when that same question falls in a different situation, in a different heart condition, the response is different. James and John didn't end up becoming the greatest people in all of creation, did they? But verse 52, it says, Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. The follow Jesus along the road is important there because he didn't just say, all right, good, now I can go do my stuff. Now I can go make my living. He stayed with Jesus. Bartimaeus, we believe, stuck around based on what it says there at the end of verse 52. So we see here in the second half of the chapter, and honestly, if you even go back and couple it to the first half of the chapter with the whole idea of, of, of wealth and things like that getting in the way of faith, we see here that, that Jesus is is absolutely dealing with, okay, what are our desires where Jesus is concerned? What do we want from Jesus? And I think he asks us that same question. And I think this week, as you, as you go out and, and, and do the things that you'll be doing, it's a good thing to ask yourself and to let God ask you and, and to meditate on, what do, I, what do I want out of this whole Christianity thing? What do I want out of my faith? What do I want from Jesus? What do I want God the Father, God the Holy Spirit to do for me? And why do I want that? Do I want it for me and simply my sake? Uh, somebody asked a question a long time ago, and I thought it was pretty profound. They said, if, uh, if you get everything you prayed for today, will it affect anybody but yourself? That's a, that's a big question, isn't it? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty powerful thought. How many days have I prayed a lot for stuff that only helps rich? Or maybe if I'm feeling particularly, you know, generous, maybe it only helps Rich and his family. Or maybe on a great day, maybe it helps Rich and his family and his church. What do I want from this faith? What do I want from this Jesus? And am I asking it for my glory or for his glory? Well, what we find out is, is when we're asking for his glory and in the way he calls us to come to him, he works miracles. When we're doing it on our terms, well, we get some lip service sometimes at best or we give some lip service sometimes at best and we end up with some empty religion i hope and pray and i, and I believe knowing you that that for 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 us in this room maybe many of you watching at home that that, that you do love jesus that you you want to serve him that, that you want to see other people come to know him and you serve to do you know to be able to accomplish that for god's glory uh, so keep doing that but if you find yourself in the time this week or in the coming days that well, maybe you're getting, you know, find yourself being a little selfish. It's okay. Jesus will still teach you and work with you through it. He has grace for us in that, each and every one of us, because we all fall into those, those ruts, and he's going to teach us through it. So be open to the teaching. Let him be glorified in everything that we do. And let's see how big of a miracle after big of a miracle after big of a miracle after big of a miracle he's going to work. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are thankful, Lord, for Jesus who he is to us, who he is for us, and who he is in, in his glory. Lord God, we don't want anything more from you than you desire to give to us that glorifies you. Help that to be true of us each and every moment of each and every day of our life. Help us to commit to that way of living from here on out. Father, thank you for those who many who have already lived many years that same way. Thank you for the impact that you've made through them and, Father, in them. Lord God, we ask, Lord, that you help us to be ministers. Help us to, to seek your will above all else and to, to do your will when you show it to us. Lord, go with us. Uh, keep us safe, but only keep us safe so that we'll be productive for your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.